This morning, our scripture reading comes to us from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 10 through 26. Let us listen for the word of the Lord for us this morning. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agog, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as much as obeying in the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. The word of the Lord Thanks be to God. If you have been following along in our 365 readings, you know that this is just a little excerpt. It's a smidgen of the story of Saul from our readings, even for today, much less over the last few days. And if you want to stay up with those 365 readings, don't forget the May ones are ready for you to download. They're on the web. You can find them. And certainly, if you need them mailed to you, let us know through the care line. We'll pop it in the mail. But over these last few days, really, we have been, in a sense, binge-watching the life of Saul. Have you been binge-watching anything good lately? Do share. It seems to be the time. Popcorn bowls are out. We're propped up on the couch, taking in the story, well, in these readings of Saul's life, and enjoying it, the whole arc of it, as we can watch it all together really quickly here. So we travel over the last few chapters of 1 Samuel, and really the whole story of Saul, isn't it interesting when we come to this moment, this morning, that it seems like the whole story is shadowed by this moment, even before it began. In our movie-watching way, we can see the opening scenes of this whole thing. 
the desire of the Israelites for a king, the reluctance of God to fulfill that request, then the relenting, which results in Saul's coronation, and really it looks like all should go well. The guy is a head taller than anyone else. And surely, wow, he must have been on People Magazine's 100 Most Handsome at least a couple years in a row. This really does look promising for Israel. For a first king, it's looking good. And then soon those looks are backed up by a couple of really good wins on the battlefield. Now this was the point, right? This was the point. This is what the desire was for that king, you know, someone that would stand up and fight their battles for them, someone that would rout the Philistines before they got trounced again. And well, so far, so good until it gets a little more difficult. And the movie watcher can see it now, head comfortable on the pillow, gummy bears tasting delicious, as the flashback scenes are brought back into view, one after another. And as you watch and you see them next to this moment that we just read, you wonder if Saul ever had a chance. This moment of rejection may have been pursuing him even more before his heart first dropped from the shock of being anointed the future king of Israel on the side of a road during that expedition to find lost donkeys. He had scarcely believed it then, and when it came time to confirm it in front of people, actual people, people that liked him and didn't like him. Well, that official coronation where this had him hiding in a supply closet until folks could find him and drag him out. Now here he is. Now here he is, hoisting stones together in a monument to himself. In a few years, you wonder if maybe he would duck ahead in embarrassment about this. How did he go from all that fear and shyness to this moment of self-grandiosity that now also includes a rather humiliating chastisement and confession in front of the guy who put him here in the first place? If he were to get or take a moment to review his life. I wonder if in this moment he feels like he could have done it any differently. Or does he feel like he's being called into account for simply the way he is, what they asked him to do? Well, whichever, he finds himself saying this to Samuel. I've sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men. So I gave in to them. I was afraid. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Okay, so here is the moment. As a movie watcher, where we might pause the video, set the popcorn aside, sit up and lean in. To rewind the film a little bit, wait, what did he say? This is a moment of profound clarity. Did Saul ever own his life? Did he ever have a grasp on what was at the core of him, what he could anchor himself in? Did he have any idea what was happening? Was he controlling his life or was something else? If we were going to chat in a Zoom room after the credits scroll by, we might discover that there really are a few different perspectives on this scene, on Saul's life for that matter, and they might range from sympathy to, are you kidding? The guy bought his own fate. Do you see how he always did what he wanted? Remember when he was about to lead the army into battle and Samuel told him specifically to wait? To make, so that he could come and make a sacrifice and then start? Saul thought he could take over Samuel's job when clearly he wasn't called to do it. You cannot mix religion and politics like that and get away with it. He was an arrogant fool, and he kept being one for his whole life. 
He'd had specific instructions from God of how to go about this challenge, and he didn't do it. Serves him right. He never could take orders. Oh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The guy hardly had a chance. Just look at that same scene again. Samuel told him to wait for seven days. And Saul did. He waited for seven days, and Samuel was late. So whose fault is this? Saul Saul saw the army losing their nerve. Didn't you see all those deserters because the blessing that they knew needed to happen wasn't happening? Why, Saul was a good leader, and he's just trying to take care of his army and take care of his people. You cannot fault the guy for that. Totally unfair. And seriously, isn't it harsh that he loses a kingship over such a small infraction of the rule? It is a few animals and one king. He can take orders, orders of what is pragmatic, what needs to be done from the people he served and what they're demanding. Tragic figure, Saul. A tragic first king taking orders from God, people, refusing orders. As you have been watching these scenes unfold, what do you think? Was there a moment that you saw a shift in the story or a truth telling of what was really happening? It wasn't long before God saw it. God regrets, it says. To be exact, God repents, meaning that God chooses to go another way. We know that's what it means to repent, is realize I'm walking down this path and I actually need to turn around and go the complete opposite way. God repents. God can see that this way with Saul as king is not going to work. You know, the whole first king idea was set up on the foundation that the king and the people would listen to the Lord and follow through and be faithful. The king, that first king, and the people would listen to the Lord and follow through and be faithful. This is what proves untrue. God realizes that relying on this first human king to be anchored in faithful listening, leadership, and genuine care for God's people is actually not happening, will not prove to be fruitful. Saul really is a tragic figure. A first king born out of the people's desire to win battles without the long view of the war. Saul is a first king born out of fear, who lived out of fear, and who ruled out of fear. Fear will always want to be first king. Fear will always want to be first king, and mercy. There is such good intentions there. Fear has quick reactions, brute force, protective hiding, quick running. But past that first adrenaline spike, fear in the driver's seat, making decisions for a life, a people, a kingdom, that trajectory for wisdom and fruitful leadership will take an ever sharper dive downward the longer it is allowed to hold the royal seat. Let fear inform you. Do not let it be your king. Let fear inform you. But do not let it form you, shape your life, assign the classes, make the rules, build the relationships, because really those could only be alliances Because truthfully, fear cannot carry communion, and it rarely looks beyond itself. Let your fear do what it was designed to do. Indicate to you your problem, but do not let it run the show. First kings simply do what we hire them to do. 
And we hire the first king of fear to face our battles for us, either by helping us hide in the supply closet while our name is being called for a daunting and far too public step into a task, a leadership, a relationship. You get it. Or oddly enough, by convincing us of our invulnerability after it has help us, helped us escape a ravenous pack of wolves, we made it free, but we are soon and somehow talked into bringing the biggest and strongest wolf home as a prize and thinking we can keep it in the backyard with some chew toys and all will be well. Our fear will find us erecting monuments to ourself, building up our outside edifice ever thicker so as not to belie the cavernous and insatiable pit where fear will not let wisdom or grace or the need to learn and grow take hold and flourish. Taking orders from the first king of fear is a destructive path. You know, it isn't even fear's fault. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do, put you on high alert that something is wrong, that something needs to be addressed, that something needs to be faced. Oh boy, it can marshal your energy for you. Or it can freeze you enough to protect you in a hidden place. But if given full control, it cannot lead you to safety. And there's no way it leads you to safety with companions by your side. It may be a hiding place, but it will never be a refuge. Fear needs help from wisdom and grace and love to do that. The first king of fear is faded before it takes its seat. Saul was faded before he even sat down. The painful reality, fear can still take the seat. Oh, this is achingly clear. Saul sits in the king's seat for 42 years. But he was never a rightful ruler of Israel. He was never a leader of the people, never a king who could be anchored in the Lord. He was never a genuine caretaker of people, never a shepherd. He couldn't be. Fear does not do that. And the Lord says, no. No, no. No king of fear, no fear king will be the leader of my people, the people whom I formed and I made, the people I call my own, no, the people God, the people of God, fear is not allowed to be our king. Fear has been unseated from the throne. This is the king the people wanted, the people king is the first king of fear. This king God rejects. God rejects the people king because God will not reject the people. God rejects the people king because God will not reject the people. The king of the people, the ruler of their lives, the shepherd of their hearts, will be one anchored into God's faithfulness. So while this first king of fear is unseated, the Lord is stepping towards and with in a plan and a way and a people where there will be a king who is rooted in God's faithfulness, where what we can rely on always is the goodness and the faith of God. We will be forever anchored in God's always choice to love, to never let go, to move toward. For friends, the true ruler of the people the one who unseats the fear king is the one who will always walk towards us. 
towards a world that is absolutely filled with fear. And the Lord of want, the Lord of love, who is anchored and faithful, can't do anything but be faithful care, will be the one that comes to those people in their moments of deepest fear. And he, that Lord will stretch out his arms and meet that fear head on. And as those arms are outstretched, ready for the largest embrace the world can experience, the Lord will scoop us up and hold us close. Just like you scoop up your children, your grandchildren, and your grandchildren when they are afraid and you say, come here, precious one. When we listen to the comfort a parent will give here, we often hear it said like this, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Do you know what we mean? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. The king of fear, the fear king, is unseated by the king who opens his arms in great love, scoops us up and says, I am here, I am here, I am here. Beloved friends, wherever you are in this day, the Lord is here. Lord, hold us close. Anchor us in your faithful love. Help us see that fear can inform us, but it will never shape us into your beautiful people. Hold us close. Amen.